Audioholics, we are on the floor of Cedia 2017. We are at the ELAC booth and we have acoustic genius Andrew Jones here to walk us through the latest that ELAC has for the Audioholics out there. And we're standing in front of the Adante line, so we're going to start here. Andrew, why don't you tell us a little bit about Adante? So it's the newest speaker series that we're doing and it's a significant step up in price point from what we did have, but that's deliberate because so far I've been doing the very affordable speakers, but as a company, we're used to doing more unaffordable speakers. So I've got to kind of take care of everything. So we start with the familiar, which is a concentric driver. The upgrade from what I did with Unify is this is now a five inch cone rather than a four inch cone, still aluminum, but a new cone profile, you know, newly developed for this, but combined with a two inch voice coil rather than an inch and a half. That gives me more sensitivity, more drive, more power handling. It also gives me some room this time to engineer a better tweeter inside of that two inch voice coil now. Now, so every speaker in the range, except clearly the subwoofer, has the concentric driver. And it's combined with either one, two or three base systems, let's say. Because from the outward appearance, looking at the front and the back, it looked, oh, it must be a closed box loudspeaker system with an eight inch woofer. It's not. This on the front is actually an eight inch passive radiator. Um, but working in a different way that you normally expect with passive radiators. First of all, in a passive radiator system, you've got the base driver and the passive radiator both on the front of the cabinet, and they are, let's say, working in parallel. These are working in series. The active drive unit is inside the cabinet with only the passive on the outside. So the sound comes through the passive to get out. Why? <laughs> but let's imagine you have a vented box loudspeaker. Drive unit on the front, vents on the front. You put an input signal to it, you get an output. You put a crossover filter, let's say a third order electrical network on the input. You're filtering the input to the driver, not the output. So anything, let's say nasty that happens in the driver or vents radiates straight out. Imagine a 100 hertz tone going in, third harmonic is at 300 hertz, comes straight out. Vent noises come straight out. Now let's take an extra smaller box and put it o totally over the front of that driver and vents and communicate out through a lightweight passive radiator. That forms an acoustic filter. The stiffness of the air and the mass of the passive radiator act as a second order low pass filter. So now I'm filtering the output of the driver rather than just the input to it. So first of all, I can simplify the electrical network, but more importantly, those nasties get filtered off. Let's go back to the example of the 100 hertz tone. This filter is set at 200 hertz, so the 300 hertz distortion component is partially filtered off. The fifth harmonic fills it off even more. So I've cleaned up to some degree the distortion products from the driver and the subwoofer. Two 12 inch woofers, 1200 watts of amplification, basically closed box brute force approach, which is typically what you'll get with small subwoofers. Uh, and three finishers, all at the same price points high gloss white, high gloss black, and a, a satin kind of rosewood finish uh, as well. So great value, but I'm pushing the performance into high end territory rather than just pure entry level. All right, so now we have something a little bit different. Yes. We're going, it is Cedia, we are an installer's uh, conference here, and so we got to look at some stuff that's in walls. And what we have is an in-wall subwoofer, so why don't you talk with us a little bit about that. The biggest problem people face with in-wall subwoofers, we are told, um, is that you never know what performance you're going to get, because you don't have a designed volume behind the subwoofer, it's whatever the you've got in the wall. Yeah, they're usually a, almost practically a raw driver with a couple drywall uh, flanges and you don't know what amplifier is being hooked to it or, or what, in, what the enclosure size is depending on how tall your ceilings are and what they're stuffed with. Right, so in the first instance you're going to design an amplifier to go with that woofer. So that's what we've done. Then you're going to do some EQ, but what EQ? Because you don't know what enclosure volume you've got. 
Um, and a further complicating factor is in our uh, S10 EQ and S12 EQ regular subwoofers, we've got this cool technique of doing in-room EQ using just the microphone in your phone, communicating over Bluetooth, and it works without the need for a calibrated microphone because if I know what the response of the subwoofer should be, and as the designer, I ought to know that, and that's defined in most instances by measuring what's called the near field response of the subwoofer. You measure close enough to the subwoofer, that measurement is not influenced by the acoustics of where the subwoofer is. Um, so we measure there, then we go to the listening position, re-measure with that same microphone. Now, regardless of the quality of that microphone, if I adjust that listening position measurement to match the near measurement, it's like a sim simultaneous equation. The unknown drops out, the unknown being the microphone response. It doesn't matter. As long as it's had some response, it doesn't have to be a calibrated response. So now I've EQ'd the listening position for that subwoofer. My problem is I wanted to apply that technique to this in-wall subwoofer. I don't know what the response is because I haven't designed the box. I haven't designed it as a system. So I can't actually apply that technique. I won't swear, but I was swearing, right? Then I, I thought of something. For the last 30 or more years, whenever I design a speaker, to measure or to confirm what the low frequency response is. You know, that's the most difficult thing for people to measure. Anechoic chambers, very few people have access to them. There's really none big enough to measure subwoofers anyway, so you use the near field measurement technique. So yes, I'll measure the near field, but I also have techniques for measuring in the far field and correcting. But I also measure the impedance curve of the speaker and fit it to an equivalent circuit model of the loudspeaker. From doing that, from just the knowledge of the input impedance, I can tell you what the frequency response of the speaker is within a half a dB. So I routinely do this. So I'm thinking, we've got a ded dedicated amplifier, and this microphone technique, if I knew what the impedance curve, or more importantly, the the resultant resonant frequency of that woofer in that enclosure is, I can tell you the frequency response without even measuring it acoustically. So basically what I do is I force, I put a resistor in series with the, a high value resistor in series with the driver, and it forces the response to more reflect what the impedance curve is. And it produces a big peak in the acoustic output at the resonant frequency. From that, and since I know what the acoustic model of the speaker is, I can tell you precisely how much added stiffness from the enclosure I've got. You know, it's moved the resonant frequency from free air to this new value. That means I have 58 liters, for example. The app can read that out and tell you, you have 58 liters, which is, you don't need to know that, but it kind of illustrates what I'm doing. From that shift in resonant frequency and the height of the peak, I know what the new acoustic response is. So I go to a lookup table and say, it needs this EQ. Since I was gonna have to apply EQ anyway, I just change it for the volume of air that I just measured. So it automatically goes to the lookup table, selects the right EQ to get back to my designed response, now independent of the enclosure volume. So this subwoofer, no matter what wall you put it in, now has always the same frequency response. And now I can then go back to applying this near field, far field technique to also EQ it to the listening location. And so it does not require a back box, you can put it in any size wall cavity. And put it into any size wall cavity. So the problem with the back box is it's only for new construction. You can't go cutting out the whole wall when you've already wallpapered it, right? And uh, if you were to try to put a back box that's only the size of the hole, you need so much power to overcome the stiffness of that very small volume of air that it's not practical. Um, and yet the alternative is, well, I don't know what performance I'm getting. Now you do. So the system is the driver itself and the mountable plates, and then these, this, this rack mount piece here. Dedicated rack mount amplifier. And there'll be two versions, uh, or almost three versions. So one will be a single woofer, single amplifier of 300 watts capability. 
then there'll be an upgraded, let's say more pro version or integrator version, which will be have the capability of driving two woofers, and there'll be uh, more powerful motor structures on those woofers. Um, and so you have the option of driving one woofer or two woofers, and if you're driving two woofers, you'll be able to make measurements of both independently. What's the target street date? I believe it's before the end of the year. Yes. And price target yet? Uh, 9.99 for the 300 watt single 10 inch woofer. I think 14.99, and someone's going to look at this video. Andrew, you got this wrong. Yeah, I'm just the design engineer. But we're still we're still prototype phase, so there's always wiggle room. There's always wiggle room. Yes. Um, and so uh, that 14.99 will be 600 watt capability uh, and single upgraded woofer. Uh, and then for an extra, maybe $400, you, you get an extra woofer. So now you can drive both woofers together. All right, of course, install our show. We got to look at some in-wall speakers as well. And uh, we're going to look at a line of, of ELAC speakers. Right now, there are some in-wall and in-ceiling speakers from ELAC that are out there on the street. But ELAC is rolling out a series that you can ask your custom installer for. Uh, a little bit of different technology in those, and Andrew's going to walk us through that. So all of these speakers are based on sort of something we've done before, either the debut line or the Unify range. So this particular line is an upgrade from the debut speaker line, box speaker line that we've got, or the in-wall versions of this, and as you say, for the integrator uh, specifically. And so we go, we take this as an example. So this would be the B6, but upgraded. Six inch woofer, uh, one inch soft dome tweeter, and now it has an aluminum woofer as opposed to the uh, aramid fiber woofer we have in the regular debut series. So that gives us performance upgrade and it continues through to a distributed audio in ceiling, uh, a home theater in ceiling where we angle both the tweeter and the woofer. And so are these visualized as potential Atmos speakers or for some poor surround? You can also placement? use them for Atmos. You don't, I mean, Dolby say you don't need angled. Uh, you can get away with regular distributed audio type speakers. But depending on your ceiling height and where you are, it can be advantageous to have them angled. Uh, or if you're doing just a, a non-Atmos system, just a 5.1, right. and you've been told, you're not having those walls, you're not cutting holes in my walls, maybe the ceilings, yeah. then you would use these and angle them appropriately. And the reason we've done a fully angled approach is when you actually look at swivel tweeters, you don't really get hardly any change in performance, even out to 15K with a, a good soft dome, with the amount of angling that you're able to engineer into one of those type of devices. It's a feel good factor, you know, um, point it, oh, there we go. But in reality, most times it's the woofer being so off axis of the woofer that you need to be concerned about at the crossover point, not the tweeter. So we angle the whole thing. But we also line it with uh, thick acoustic felt to reduce some of the internal reflections you get as a result of uh, basically burying it in that cavity. And, then and two, it's a two-way system. Two-way systems, they're all two-way systems. And then obviously the center channel slash LCR, depends on, you know, if you want more output. And then the subwoofer, as we discussed, for the uh, simpler version of the powered in-wall speaker. And the Unify, I'll, I'll put in some shots from the other side, so those are the concentric then, is that the case? Yes, so basically take what we did with the Unify speaker. Mm. Concentric, mid-tweet, uh, six-inch woofer now because the demands of install is a six or an eight inch woofer. And the world, we're in the process of developing eight inch versions as well to satisfy that demand, but right now we're launching with the six inch versions. So in the case of the LCR, this is a concentric driver. Excellent. But, but with upgraded tweeter, it's now a metal dome tweeter for this series, uh, but still with the uh, aluminum woofers. And so it just goes from two to three way. Right now, the upgraded versions for that range for the in-ceiling are still two ways. We are looking at a full three-way concentric version. It's just 
there's a lot of engineering to do all the mechanical design and the tooling to try and fit a three-way system in, into an in-ceiling speaker. So that will be a later proposition in that range. Hi Audioholics, we're coming to you from Cedia 2017. I'm here with Chris from ELAC and after we've taken a look at some of the speaker products, we're now going to look at the source material. How are you going to feed those great ELAC speakers? And the Discovery Series has a few options for us. So, Chris, walk us through. So we'll start off actually with another speaker, but a speaker part of the Discovery Series. This is the brand new Discovery Z3 model. This is a wireless powered zone speaker that people can place anywhere in their home that works with our Discovery music server, but also works without it if they don't have it. So beyond being a Discovery endpoint, it's also a Spotify Connect device, a Bluetooth device, an AirPlay device. Um, so you can use it basically, uh, or as a, just a Rune endpoint as well if you're running Rune software on your computer. Um, but it's a great little device. Andrew obviously designed the acoustics for it. Uh, the compilation of the drivers, we have a four inch uh, uh, bass driver on the left, four inch bass driver on the right, two one inch soft dome tweeters, along with two four inch passive radiators. So it was designed to basically sound like a pair of our debut B4 speakers, but are self powered uh, and wireless. You can put anywhere in the house. Uh, the sound quality out of this is actually quite remarkable. Um, from a bass level, it actually is a minus three dB at 40 hertz. Um, one of the things that's we had to notice it actually moved around a little bit on the table when we crank it up a little bit, so that was uh, being fixed. Um, but it's designed to be a self-contained music system. You can put it anywhere in your house, have multiple units, or you can have just a single unit if you want to fill up a room with sound. Um, it sounds phenomenal. It's going to be $499. Um, but like I said, if you want to just use Spotify, download the Spotify app. It drops on there and works. Um, or Bluetooth or AirPlay, but obviously we like it to work with the Discovery Music Server, and in the Discovery Music Server source section, it just shows up as an output. So along with all the other uh, outputs that you find with the Discovery Music Server, you end up seeing the Discovery C3, click on it, use the same uh, interface, and now you're able to play whatever you want, just in what we think is a little higher quality than most of the other products out there. So we've taken a look at the Z3 wireless speaker, and as Chris mentioned, the best way to feed that is using the Rune software over the Discovery server, and so he's going to talk a little bit about what that looks like, how you take your vast music library and pump it to the speakers around your house in a really easy to use interface. So we obviously have the current Discovery Music Server designed for consumer use for smaller libraries. What we wanted to do is expand that Discovery product for the custom integration market. Make a true product that made doing multi-zone audio very simple for the integrator. So we came up with the Discovery Pro, which is this model right here. So this takes the Discovery Music Server that you're used to, that runs the Rune Essential software on it, but it now gives you five dedicated zone outputs with four of those outputs already being powered. So it integrates uh, an eight by 50 watt amplifier. So you can actually wire up two, uh, four stereo pairs of speakers through your house, wire it up to this, hook up a hard drive full of content, point it to your NAS, and literally you're up and running with a four zone system. Plus it has an additional um, uh, passive output that you can up to a fifth zone. So it's a five zone all-in-one chassis unit to deliver up to your house. And the best part is all the zones on this can be synchronized completely. Uh, they can be, all be playing something different, but we also support all the other native wireless uh, protocols that we did with the regular discovery. So on top of being able to discover, use the uh, local outputs, you can also play to AirPlay product, you can play to discovery endpoints like the Z3 speaker we showed, you can play to Rune endpoints, plus you can also talk to Soto speakers as well. So all those devices show up in the uh, app that we have, under available network, choose enable, and now you can add five, six, seven, eight, nine zones, some wired, some wirelessly. And for the integrator, we'll offer an upgraded piece of this called the Discovery Connect, which will then simply, by connecting a simple ethernet jack, enable six additional zone outputs that you can play and synchronize as you want to as well. So it's a real easy way for somebody to simply get into a full multi-zone audio for a whole home distribution with a single rack unit that simply just connect to speakers and you're good to go. And I like that. So if you've already got a little bit into that, that Sonos uh, walled garden, you can now open that up a little bit and have this fancy Rune interface that goes along with that. A absolutely. It makes it simple. So while, of course, we love people to ball all, buy all ELAC products, we know they're not going to. Why not take advantage of some of the products that may already have? A lot of people own AirPlay devices. Every receiver in the world is pretty much an AirPlay device. Um, a lot of uh, receivers support other protocols as well. So why not make something that talks to everything they already have, as well is hopefully through uh, uh, the quality of our products people think of, they might upgrade and might end up buying some of our products as well. So. Any street dates, prices? Uh, this will be shipping in December at a retail price of $19.99. All right, thank you so much. Well, we've had a great time with ELAC at CDO 2017. We're going to see what else is out there on the floor. Keep watching.